Yeah. Okay, uh, we get uh, started. Uh, like to welcome all of you in person here and also uh, online to uh, the joint meeting between the aerospace and the LMA <coughs> chapters of the I think crazy uh, my name is Mohammed Karani, and I'm the chair of the aerospace chapter. And uh, <coughs> tonight is another chair or another chapter to uh, talk to us. Um, our chapter is basically, as you know, the all volunteers, we always need volunteers. If you can uh, spend a few hours a month uh, to do various activities, and you know, we are involved in a uh, lot of activities, uh, meetings like this is a part of it. And we can always use more uh, help with more volunteers uh, for our uh, scope of things that we do for my company. Um, tonight's speaker is uh, Jerry, and Jerry Nods, and uh, he's a uh, um, retired Air Force officer uh, after 24 years. Um, I must say there is something about the uh, Air Force officers. After retirement, they get involved in a lot of other activities. <clears throat> I don't know. Yes. <laughs> anyway, and you can see the list of his activities on the bio that is uh, was published by in the newsletter for for this for this talk. It was really fascinating. Um, tonight's talk is about <clears throat> the um, safari program at the at the Air Force that really has been an integral part of it and. As I understand, uh, you have written a book with two other colonels, two books, two books on the on, on the topic. So, um, look forward to hearing about the program and uh, what Jerry has to say. Thank you very Thank much. You that was beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't read the bio. <laughs> okay. First of all, I have to recognize my brothers online here. So, yeah. brother Paul. So, behave your Paul. Behave yourself, Paul. <laughs> anyway, uh, what I want to do tonight is share with you some experiences and at the same time tell you about this exciting program. Back in 1973, I was an instructor for the Air Force at Major Air Force Base up in Sacramento. I don't think they're a on, the, the on the platform and I got that job because I was the only one that studied solid state and we were converting the Air Force electronics program to solid state. So I thought, well, that's going to be exciting. Well, I'm on the platform talking, and all of a sudden, somebody comes in the front door, came over to me, and he said, the sergeant of personnel needs to see you immediately. Well, you know, an officer in the Air Force or Army or anybody, when you're told that some sergeant wants to talk to you, you don't argue. You go, <clears throat> especially with personnel. So I did. And he said, you're the luckiest guy in the world, shook my hand. I said, why? He said, you're being transferred to Germany. Really? I haven't finished the tour there as an instructor. I said, this is a very special program, and uh, you'll have to have some special clearances and all that stuff. But he couldn't tell me any more about it, except he said, here's a projector. And back then, you take a projector and see the movies. And I had a nice big can with the movie about Germany and then in the Air Force. So I took it home to my wife and I walked in the door and she said, where are we going in Germany? Now that shows you how powerful the wives club is. <laughs> they knew all over the place before she before I was ever adult. Anyway, where I was going is to this program on the operational side. I didn't know that at the time. All I knew, I was going to go to Germany, and eventually I found out I was going to be doing some flying. So let's talk about this. Like I said, I'm going to be talking about uh, my experiences, and uh, let's talk about the purpose of Big Safari. It still exists, and it's much bigger than when I was in it. And the whole purpose of the program is to make fast whatever the need is happen. 
So we had our own set of regulations and rules, and we didn't have to follow mill spec. If I needed something from Sears, I went down to the Sears store and got it and put it in the airplane. And that you don't do in a regular Air Force. So we had special management here. And then uh, we just said we can we could do the impossible. And by the way, the impossible just costs a little more. And you'll see some of the things we did, and you'll say, How in the world do you do that? Well, that's it. So anyway, uh, that's what our, our great purpose is. And we have a number of principles, and it's all uh, criticizing the standard system because we say we're fast response. You go in and order something in the fast system or the, the common system now, standard, and it's going to take you a year, maybe. We'll do it in six months or less. Cradle to grave, we own it when we build it, and we service it through its life. That you don't see in normal, in normal operation. That's what we call cradle to grave. Low cost, well, we try to make it low cost, and I'll talk about the other structure. Uh, limited production, our purpose is not to have a fleet necessarily. We violated that, which I'll tell you later, but not very often. It's usually onesie, twosies, and then uh, go on. Minimum but adequate, and that's really true. Is that we don't have to fancy up anything. We just keep it absolutely minimum and then it's gonna happen. It's off the shelf. You see that a lot now. We brought that into the Air Force system. They didn't used to do that. Commercial off the shelf, COS, is, uh, is a, a standard way of buying things now. Modify, don't develop. We did not have a license to develop, except I'll tell you a neat story that really was development. And then provide the necessary, not nice to have. Those seem like crazy things, but they matter. Uh, General Dynamics drew this up for me one day because I was making so many changes in one of these airplanes. They said, we have a mod request to put zippers. Will zippers work? And you see there's a zipper on the top and a zipper on the side because we did open the side of the airplane and do a, um, and I'll talk about that program when we get there. But modify, don't develop, all those phrases are, uh, are standard phrases. Okay, now here's how it works. You can't do this without a government and, and industry team. We had four teams. One was at General Dynamics. One was at E-Systems, Greenville, Texas, which is now L3. And we had one down in San Diego and one in Ontario, California, over here with Lockheed. And each one of those had an office. We were in, in that assigned to those offices and we ran the show there and we wrote work directly with the contractors on doing the jobs. So uh, this limited budget is kind of a farce. It, the budget becomes what it is when you get the new program. So we don't go in and say, we need this budget for the year. Yeah, we have certain operating funds as standard, but the real operational budget for the unit is that that's developed when you see what the programs you're going to be working on at that time. Then multiple pro programs, and you'll see uh, the ones I worked on, and you say, and most of these were done on the same at the same time. And all kinds of aircraft, we'll talk about that. Defense contractors, like I said, Lockheed and uh, LTV, BKB Systems and Raytheon and L3, General Dynamics and Ryan down in uh, San Diego and then uh, General Atomics. We started the drones, by the way. Okay. This is the first program for Big Safari. Pie Face. This is a C-97, normally a cargo airplane, but they needed some photographs in uh, East Germany. We were working the border or the uh, corridors into Berlin, and I'll show you another chart on that. Uh, this project involved opening up the airplane and inserting this little device. It's a camera. 240 inch focal length, built by Boston University professors. 
And that thing, it that's in the the museum in Dayton. And I test the docents when I go there and say, where's the camera? This is called Big Bertha. Where's Big Bertha? And I have yet to be surprised because every one of the docents I talked to said, it's under the B-52 wing. <laughs> <laughs> they know exactly. And they brought it out to make a little bit more of it because they, they just kind of put it there when we gave it to them many years later. And uh, they didn't really know how to handle that because when you look at this, is it, that's the camera? Yeah. This is a camera that shot the golf ball on the green. You heard that story many, many years ago. And of course, we contend you can uh, read Titleist on the golf ball. Okay. Now, the purpose is to get photographs around Berlin, and that's what it was for. And after that wore away as a project, then they moved down to uh, Czechoslovakia, wow, and then it ended up being used in Cuba when Castro was doing his crazy stuff. And then, of course, uh, the mission just, uh, the requirements of the mission exceeded the capability of this, so we went off to another thing. That was not one of my projects, by the way. That happened before I came into the program. This one, however, is really interesting. And you can go on, when I get to the point, I'll tell you where to go on the internet to see the fact that we were in there because um, the story is on the internet. Okay, first of all, uh, the scientists back there, Dr. Teller and Hans Beth, was have, they were having an argument because Khrushchev said he had a 100 megaton bomb. And that kind of terrified them because they said, if they're doing that, we better be paying attention on how. So they decided, first of all, we have to prove that that indeed was a 100 megaton bomb. So they put together this program called Speedlight and Dominic U is another one of the airplanes. There were three of them. They were like the 707s. These are 135s, and you'll see them throughout this whole program tonight. Anyway, the airplane was configured by these two scientists in order to test the radiation levels and determine the magnitude of the bomb blast. So that means that airplane is going to be exposed. Well, I don't know how they selected the crew. Again, this happened before I got involved. This, by the way, is the bomb. And if you go on internet and plug in Big Ivan, bingo. When you read into that, and it's all in there, pictures and everything else, because that's where I got my pictures. And this is the bomber that's going to drop it. There it is in flight. And this airplane was handy and got all these pictures. And of course, uh, the rest he gave us a few more. He says, well, if you're going to tout our form, we're going to give you pictures too. So big Ivan's on the internet. But uh, the only problem was when they brought the airplane back <clears throat> at the end of that mission on that airplane, it was black. And by the way, they proved that really that bomb was only 58 megatons. And then tell you how close they got to the blast. Okay. Like I said, Vic Safari had a lot of challenges. And I ended up being the manager of the follow on of this program, which I will show you later. Okay. So now we're going to talk about some operational uses to give you the kind of idea how far we penetrated into the job. We didn't just build the airplane, we got into the actual mission, the systems that were required for the mission and how that was, and we trained the people and then maintained those airplanes and brought them back to the depot that built it every now and then to make sure the airplane was up to speed. Okay, here's the, the concept of aerial recon for electronics. And I do this for the IEEE. So right here, aircraft are flown near the borders and they're high enough that they can penetrate their look into the country. And that's what this crazy, I'm not so sure if this, this diagram is really helpful. But anyway, you can see this is the course of the airplane. And then this is the radar they're reading, monitoring. 
And that goes also for uh, regular communications. So you can run peripheral reconnaissance, not have to penetrate that, that line, but still get the information you're looking for. So the objective is to build airplanes and uh, that will do that and have the capability to gain information. When I was involved in this, I flew those airplanes. Our, our operation was down here in Wiesbaden, and these are the three quarters into Berlin, the yellow market or the yellow lines. And our job was to go in one quarter, do our work around Berlin. So we're checking out around of the peripheral look and then come out the other quarter. And of course we're checking out what's on either side of the quarters. And uh, these airplanes are configured for all kinds of stuff. The antennas come out the wings, they, they're covert and uh, clandestine and doors open and cameras are there and all kinds of crazy stuff. The only time you get in trouble is if you have antennas coming out the wingtips in Germany in the winter, sometimes they don't come back in. Well, you can't land when you show up that <laughs> the airplane is not just an airplane, you know? So uh, we just discovered it's a fancy way we're having a meeting. How are we gonna do this? Because it had a door that opened and then the antenna popped out. And one of the engineers in the meeting said, uh, he came in, remember these plastic brooms with all the, it's just a plastic broom and has all these, these plastic strips or tubes that are coming down? He said, here, that's a solution. So we took the doors off and put those on the, right there where the antennas were, it punched right through it because, you know, it's plastic, not gonna freeze. So it worked, crazy stuff. Remember, off the shelf ideas work. We modified the airplane. This is the organization I was in, 7405th. This was the 7499th group in Wiesbaden. We had three squadrons, the 05th, 06th, and 07th. The 05th was all C-97s and a T-29. Uh, there were more than one. All right, these were the courses we went with in the Baltic, all along here down over Yugoslavia, into the, the area here around uh, Israel and that, and then Black Sea. And uh, what's the name of that, that country is being bought right now by the Russians over there? If you don't know, what's, what's the name of that? Ah, that was our target. Uh, if you look at this map, you see this funny M? Our trick was to get a particular radar that the Russians had in Ukraine. And the only way we could do that is to fly the airplane into, like we're gonna penetrate and then come back out and try it again and then come back out. MiGs on all, on, always on our wings and they would always try to get us to land and <laughs> penetrate. And uh, those were fun missions. And down here, of course, that got interesting. So uh, we would go to Athens, Greece and deploy out of there. And if we didn't do it there, we went to Turkey. And we were in a place that was really funny when we, went, we went to Turkey. And uh, the rule was when you arrive and get off that airplane, you don't know anybody and nobody knows you and do not talk to anybody. And the place was loaded with all these weird looking airplanes, including the U-2 and others. And, uh, but that was exciting. And the, the other rule is you had to drink one Leuvenbroi every day because that kept your stomach in mind. And don't ask me how, but it worked. And when you're in the dawn of Turkey and you have to live downtown because there's no room on the base, you gotta watch what you eat but that beer will save you. Okay, so these are the two of the airplanes we flew over there. All right, this is a typical shot. There's the MiGs on our, you know, uh, helping us. Uh, this was a shot over, and of course that's a painting, but it was a shot over the Baltic. They really liked that. <clears throat> okay. Now this is some of the product. 
Now this one, remember the last time I talked, this is a SAM site. And this was shot in Germany. And we watched those very carefully because we learned a lot of tricks before we went to Southeast Asia. And there's an airport and uh, this is the same one. And we watched them very carefully because of what they're flying and how they're flying them and all this stuff. You get out of line, you penetrate that, those corridors. We had a T-39 shot down one day and uh, General Mayfield was the chief of staff of the Air Force at the time. He came over to Wiesbaden. <laughs> it wasn't one of ours, but it was near. And uh, he was talking to Sink Yusef, which is a four star that runs that area of, the, of Europe. And he told him just very clearly, he said, if you shoot, you get one more shot down, your ass better be on it. And I was standing right there, so I know he said it. Anyway, we discovered these special hangers, and those were all done with good, good cameras. So there was a benefit. Of course, we didn't handle the product. We just were able to share in what we created. And this is the, uh, the 7407, and you'll see more about this airplane. This is RB-57F, and it flew in the Baltic and down the Black Sea, and, uh, and we lost one right there. And we were not able to prove how it happened. It, the airplane just disappeared. And there were, that's a two-man airplane. So, uh, okay, so now let's talk about the actual programs. My very first program is Rivet Kite, or was Rivet Kite. Rivet Kite is a T-29, uh, CT-29, and it was, it was a, at that time we were flying it in Germany, it was a photo bird that had cameras. And we flew in and out of Berlin uh, corridors, and we had an army major that sat in the back at a window. And whenever he saw something, he just pressed a button and the, and the navigator opened the door and took a picture. And that was the only passenger that ever flew in that airplane, even though that was a passenger airplane. So I understand. Now, this is a configuration in its next life as Rivet Kite. Rivet Kite was a special SIGM, Signal Intelligence Comment Airplane, which would carry uh, linguists. And you see all the antennas around this thing? It looks like a porcupine. It had the most sophisticated recon SIGM comment system I ever knew of. It had a daisy chain down the, the center aisle that tied in to the stations. You had 10 operator stations, all computer controlled, totally automatic. And it, the only problem with it, it flew like this. It was so tail heavy. Well, I was introduced to this as my, when I just arrived at General, Dyna General Dynamics in Fort Worth, Texas. They said, we want you to go to Nashua, New Hampshire and see what you can do with the problem we have up there. And I figured I'm, I'm a captain, I'm cannon fodder, and I'm being tested. The problem was Sanders Associates was the contractor and they had these airplanes in their big hangar because they were top secret. And uh, they weren't letting our mechanics in to service the airplanes. You can't let an airplane sit in a hangar and not service it to make sure everything's gonna operate when you pull it out to fly. And uh, I understand that there was a little bit of a problem. And <laughs> so I was assigned a uh, Chief Master Sergeant, Howie Marsh, as my mate, and we would travel together, get all this done. So he and I <clears throat> took off and went to Sanders, or went up to Nashville, New Hampshire. And I'll tell you part, wife's tale. Okay, so we arrive and go get dinner. And he said, well, what are you gonna do? I says, I'm gonna make a call. He says, well, when are you gonna do it? I said, two in the morning. And who are you calling? Doc Sanders. Will he be at home? I have the number. And I did. I wanted his attention. And I figured a captain going to a manufacturer like this, and a, Good sturdy Navy outfit up there. 
I said, I think he needs to know me before I introduce myself. So we talked and I said, I'll be at your office at eight tomorrow morning. I hope you will be available. And I told him who I was representing. He said, oh, I'll be there. So I went to see him and I told him what the problem was. We shook hands, problem went away. So I'm coming home as a hero. So they wrote it in their damn book back in day. This is give them all the tough ones. And uh, that airplane then, when we finished flying it, I flew in the airplane when we were doing the flight test. And Doc Sanders said, it's not going to meet spec. I said, I'm sorry. I looked at your algorithms and they're beautiful. Hey, it's going to work and it's going to beat spec. He said, no, I don't think so. How are you going to test it? I'm going to bring up the operators who are going to normally fly it and they'll operate the system and like that. And we'll find out. He was not happy. He was going to put his engineers in there and said, no, you're not. So I called security service and they sent us the guys and we flew and then came back. We did two or three missions out over Boston, came back and uh, we were trying to find the locations of things was the target of this. So we had to plot them all out. We did it with the computers and then we did it by hand and uh, it was unbelievable. So I just looked at Doc Sanders. I said, do you have any other comments? He said, give me the contract. I'm signing. We're taking it. I accept. And that was it. So the next thing, I had to get this to Osan, Korea, <clears throat> north of Seoul. Well, it was not going to fly there with all that equipment in it. So he had to strip the airplane, send that stuff over in a, uh, in a big airplane, a 141. And then we had crews that flew this, these three airplanes over there. But uh, that was fun. And that was my first mission. I said, geez, there's a lot of latitude. Okay. The next one I had was Rivet Digger. Rivet Digger was the follow on to that one I told you, one of the first slides. Okay. This is an AEC airplane. And its job was to monitor nuclear tests in the Pacific. And we had three of these. And each one of them had its own lab as the master. Uh, Sandia, Los Alamos, and Lawrence Radiation. And uh, I ran the program out of Kirtland, New Mexico. And we had some RB-57s out there that could air sample too. So you see these windows on the side of this thing? Well, one of the airplanes had windows on this side, the other airplane had windows on the other side. So they could fly along and look, get the whole coverage, both sides. And then we had a cover monitoring it. And we had another one, a third airplane doing some other tests at the same process time. And uh, that was quite a challenge. We used to meet in Las Vegas once a year and have a meeting with AEC and all these lab guys. And they would present their projects and we would say whether we're going to approve the modifications. Well, <clears throat> this was very interesting. I sat in the back of the room in, a, in one of the hotels in Vegas and everybody's filled that room because they were interested in their own projects. And I knew the budget. I already talked to the guy that's running the program. And he and I are already made the decisions what we're going to approve or not. And uh, my boss from Dayton was there and he sat beside me and he watched what was going on. And of course, the guy, the CMC would introduce the scientists and the scientists would get up and discuss his program and the value of it and all this stuff. And uh, when he got all done, he'd look around and I'd give a thumbs up to the guy that's speaking. And I wrote it in the book. I just approved the program. And my boss was watching this. I was doing this for about an hour and a half. And he said, what's going on here? I said, that's the system. We got to make these scientists really think they need to make a plug for it. These are all decided long before the meeting. But they feel good when they leave. We feel good. And then we get to work. <laughs> Crazy world. Okay. This is my baby. I was on a nice trip to Germany, delivering an airplane one time, and I got a call. I got to get down to a skiff and get on a, a top secret line, which I did. And it was a call saying I had to get back 
to the States immediately and go to Offutt Air Force Base. Remember, I'm a captain. And I said, and what am I going to do at Offutt? You're going to take over the big team airplanes. At SAC, really? Are you sending armor plate or what that I'm going to wear when I go into SAC headquarters at Delabat? said, no, you'll do it. You're okay. So I called the guy. In each depot, they have responsibility for an airplane. The depot for the 135, which that is, is Oklahoma City. And we had a guy there, and uh, Britt Martin was his name. He was a civilian, but he was a big safari guy in, in Oak City. So I called him up, and I said, Britt, meet me in Omaha at the office on such and such a day at such and such an hour, because I wanted to make sure I got some cover of knowledge, because I hadn't been there that long, maybe two years. And uh, so I went in there, met Brett. We went into the club at Omaha, off at Air Force Base, SAC headquarters, and the car and the bar emptied. Just the two of us went in there. Everybody left. And I looked at Brett and I said, Wow, did you not use deodorant today? Or what's wrong here? And we did it in the morning at breakfast, did the same thing. So, that, okay. So we go into SAC headquarters and they have a table about that long and it's it's got a whole bunch of majors and captains and there's a lieutenant colonel at the end and I'm at the center. And I have Brick right beside me. So I said, okay, everybody's now here. So let's talk. Says, uh, do you want the good news or the bad news? Now this team of 10 airplanes like this, not as good, were delivered by another company and that was supposed to be SAC's end of the world wonder recon system, totally automatic, and it never worked. 10 of them. So I know that, they don't know I know that, but I'm sitting there and I said, you want the good news or the bad news? I said, and they said, well, give us the bad news first. I said, I don't have any. Then what's the good news? I said, does everybody have a notepad? If you don't, let's take a 10 minute break and everybody get notepads and pencils. We got work to do. So they did and they came back. And, I said, and they said, now what? I says, I want you to take each individual, everything you want in the new airplane because you're the designers. And if you don't have it on there, when we deliver the airplane, it's your fault. You understand? And boy, did they get busy. I had a family and friends. We didn't have to buy another drink. We didn't pay for dinner or anything. So we went home and the first airplane was gonna be this, Combat Set 1. And Combat Set has a funny thing. See that there? That little spot on the wing? That's an antenna set. This has an extended tail and you can just see that. That's another antenna set. There's one in the nose right there and there's one on the other wing. And why? because you want that airplane totally out of your view. And you can see 360 degrees without any interference with an airframe. And that airplane is still flying. I built three of those. Two of them are flying. One was converted to another job because its mission ran out. Okay, now that's where I, th I was a captain, we did this. And we configured that whole darn airplane and designed it as zero dynamics. And I flew many hours in that thing. I'm proud of it. Like I said, when you hear on the news that some MIGs are interfering with our airplanes up there, it's very likely this one or another one I'm going to show you. Okay. Well, I come to find out when I'm at, at uh, uh, Debt One, Fort Worth that uh, my job also is to do this, to fly this RB-57F. And uh, that's a two-man airplane. I was in the backseat. Anyway, this has a Hayek camera in it, 66-inch focal length. It's about as long as where I'm standing, where you are, about that big around. Carbon film, it will not twist. Our cameras always had to be pre-soaked for temperature because the platen would misshape if it had a temp temperature shock. 
So this was designed, this camera was designed by Joven Dynamics and uh, it was a CCD, not a platen. And you guys know what CCD, charge couple device. And it became the platen for these cameras from then on. And the reason why that airplane, now that airplane came from an RB57. RB57 has been around for years. They were built by the Brits. And uh, we needed an airplane. Now I was not involved in the creation of that airplane, but we needed an airplane that could loiter. The U-2 can't loiter. The SR sure can't loiter. This airplane can carry the same payload and loiter in the same area close to the U-2 altitude. And that's why I had to check out in this little suit. And to get into that suit, you had to go down to Florida and go in a chamber to 100,000 feet with one other person. And that tested that suit. But one thing I learned, the gloves, your hands are like claws in the gloves. They're not straight because if the suit inflates, number one, if you don't have that cord that's on a ring around your neck tight, you're gonna be inside the suit and your nose and everything else is gonna be up here. Not a good way to fly an airplane. So anyway, uh, that was quite an experience. We had to sit there and suck 100% oxygen for an hour and a half, then go in the chamber after you're in the suit closed up. And if you have claustrophobia, don't volunteer for, for that job. But uh, actually, I really enjoyed that. <clears throat> the last time I had anything to do with that airplane it was just a few years ago. And I got a call, says, hey, uh, we're going to pull another. NASA's flying two of these all the time. And they needed another one. So they said, which tail number did you last fly? because they were still in storage there in Davis Mountain. And I told them, and they pulled that airplane and took it to Denver, where the uh, uh, Sierra Nevada research had a plan and rebuilt that airplane. And you should see it. Wow, it's beauty. It's flying today. Okay. Ribbon Amber, this is a sad affair. Ribbon Amber was a very special bird that was used out of Shimia to monitor the Russians' uh, rockets and missiles. Okay, this thing had a radar in it that uh, required 350 kVA for power. It had to have a special engine in it. And uh, actually that was a Lycoming T-35. T-55, I mean, okay. So it had that radar, that whole side is a radar antenna. It's huge. 12 foot by, by 20 foot laminated fiberglass radar. The radar inside there, they had to put a lead wall between that part of the system and the cockpit to protect the crew. One tenth of a centimeter, <clears throat> or no, one tenth of uh, meters target, the size of a soccer ball at 300 miles. Just stop and think about the size of that. 300 miles, and you're tracking a soccer ball. And you could go a thousand miles if you raise the target size. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, that was a phase array radar, by the way. Cobra Ball, I managed that program and I didn't create it. That flies, used to fly out of Shimia. And you'll notice the one picture, it's not missing a wing, that wing is painted black because there are sensors in that side of the airplane that would be affected by a wing that shows itself. So you paint it black, it disappears to that sensor, okay? This little jewel was one day they said, we have this sensor that has to be free space to do its measurement. 
I said, I know what that means. We're going to have to open the side of the airplane. Yeah. Can we do that? I said, I did it before. I can do it on this one. And um, this little thing, that's the door that's going to slide open. We built inside a little compartment that seals it from the rest of the airplane so that when it opens, you don't have a pressure problem. Also, <clears throat> we work at it so that the airflow this way, going past that door, if you do it right, it doesn't know there's a hole there. If you don't do it right, well, your replacement will know why you're not there. <laughs> but we did a lot, a lot of wind tunnel tests. But uh, all these other crazy antennas, this one, and uh, look all this. <clears throat> its job was to monitor also the Russian operation out of on the other side of Shimya, Kamchatka. Okay, that's no not in use anymore because that part of the area is open. That is the world. Okay, now this, this is River Joy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Last week, they made an announcement that uh, Megs were chasing uh, one of our recce birds. That's what it was. And uh, it's an elip comment bird. So a lot of linguists in there, a lot of other uh, people monitoring the signals. And... Uh, there's a lot of them. This turned into a fleet. It was so darn good. It just replicated. I was in the selection committee on this when we selected the contractor to build the airplane. And <laughs> that was quite an interesting occasion, which will never be published. Combat Talon. <clears throat> I was a manager for Combat Talon later in my career. Combat Talon was used uh, in many movies. And uh, and I'll show you the example. Well, one of them is right here. They used that in Green Beret. That's the Fulton Recovery System. You can't really see it very carefully, but there's little, a little device here and one on the other side that come forward to a V. And then you can't see it here. I think I have another picture that will show you. There's a wire that goes from the tip of the con to the wing tip, and you can see why. What the trick is, you have a bundle, and inside the bundle is a balloon and a lot of cable and a big harness for a person. And what you do, you, you put the person in the harness, you open up that balloon, it inflates itself, it goes on up with that cable. <clears throat> the airplane is looking for that cable and it captures the cable. Now, part of that is going to go, if you're flying it right, part of that's going to go across the top of the airplane. And then you have to open the uh, hatch and somebody has to go through the hatch with dikes, cut the cable. That's fun. Then that is cinched and the cable is locked and then it'll come underneath the airplane. And the reason why you have those wires on the side to make sure it doesn't try to go outside of the center of the airplane. So it comes underneath and think of yourself in that. <clears throat> what this and I will do. You fly right underneath that airplane, the back door is open and they pull you in. Any volunteers? <laughs> well, I understand that the, uh, the first time they did that was an emergency some scientists had died in the North Pole <clears throat> in an operation, excuse me. And they wanted to get him out of the North Pole. At that time of the year, they couldn't do it. They couldn't fly in and just pick him up. So they said, well, we have a device to take care of that. So they put his body in that harness, pulled him out of there. He wasn't able to report his experience, but he got out of there. Okay, what else is on there? <clears throat> By the way, this is rain following. This thing could fly very, very low and it'll climb a mountain. It tests the ones we used to fly, you know, where uh, that little mountain is out there, Ontario, California. Okay. 
just fly up that thing right down the other side. Now, I don't say, and I wouldn't eat a big breakfast if you're going to fly that mission, because that gets to be very, very interesting. But they can, uh, 250 minimum altitude, 250 feet. You can't even fly a private airplane around here with less than 500 feet. But, uh, and the back door is a special door. And we'll talk about that. There's the operator station for in there because this is an infill exfill. You know what that means? You got somebody behind the lines that you need out. This is the airplane you go in with and you bring them out. And you can land if you can. If not, you got their option. And John Wayne used this thing in Green Berets, by the way. Okay. Ever hear of the Moab? The mother of all bombs. This is the only airplane at that time that could deliver that bomb. And this is how they did it. Special door, because you're running high speed. And that door is, you know, you just can't open the back door of a 130 uh, doing this. You have to have a special door. And we built that. And inside is this. This is the Moab. Back then it was that size. Today it's not. I mean, whenever you take an airplane, he's got six of them <laughs> and they're not that size and they're not a 130. So then they have a little chute that pulls it out of there and off it goes down to do its job. You know the purpose of the Moab? It was supposed to be, <clears throat> I don't have the, uh, the size of the bomb, but it's supposed to create the crater. And when it creates a crater, it'll create a little earth shake down. Now, these airplanes or the, the new version of the Moab will have air, the same bomb going down the same hole and it just keeps drilling. And there's no munitions in it all. It's depleted uranium. There's nothing harder. And you get it going at the right speed. You could, you'd think you had an explosion. The compression will show it. Okay, combat talent, again. I was sitting in the office in Dayton and uh, <clears throat> this is about 66, I think. And I got a phone call and I'm sitting in the boss's office and, and I pick up the phone and it was for me from the Pentagon. And uh, it was a pretty high level phone call. And the conversation, I made sure the phone was open so everybody could hear. The conversation went, I can't do that, can I? And I said, no. Well, how soon could I? I said, can you wait for an answer till Monday? I said, yeah. Of course, our general. Yeah, I can, I can wait till then. I said, good, I'll, I'll even give you the price. So I hung up. My boss looked at me and said, what the hell did you just do? Well, it turns out <clears throat> the week before they had the raid in Antibia. Remember that? That's where Idi Amin had a few Israelis there as captives. And uh, a young major who was the brother of the current prime minister of Israel uh, headed up a force and went in and got those Israelis. Now, what's that have to do with anything? Well, uh, Benny Pellet, who was the chief of staff of the Israeli Air Force, was flying in the command ship that we had built for him during this whole process. So this young major went in there doing this, and they were able to fly out of Israel and go do this, no problem. Unfortunately, if we had that problem, we don't have combat talent in flight refuelable. And then you could not fly nonstop, or you could not fly from the US to Israel without an in-flight refueling. Because no country in Europe would allow you to land if you told them you were going to Israel. Why? You know, some weirds. But nonetheless, that was the rule. So what he was essentially saying is, what's it gonna to be to put in-flight refueling in that airplane? Well, that was easy for me to assume that's what he meant. 
Wouldn't you assume that? And my boss said, what are you talking about? So I gave him the article about, about Idi Amin and all that stuff. And so I went out to Ontario, California, and sat down with Lockheed and let them know ahead. I said, we're working the weekend, guys. So we pulled a, a team of Lockheed engineers together. And uh, I told them what the job was going to be. And so we said, we need to have an airplane to work with. I says, okay. And I looked out over there. We had a whole bunch of airplanes back for maintenance. We called it Iran. Inspect and repair as necessary. But so we pulled one of the combat talent who was there and we brought it in and see this rig? We chained that airplane to the hangar floor inside. And we built a structure here that would hold a probe that would come from a 135 tanker. And the idea was, can we put it in the right place and have the airplane fuselage tolerate the pressure? Because we're going to put in the same in-flight refueling system we use in the B-52. It's called the URRC. It's a universal uh, system. I said, well, that won't help. We can't do that because there'll be no headroom. Oh, no, no, no. Come on, we'll show you. So I went on the airplane, and the devils are really, those engineers were really bright, and I loved them. So we walked into the airplane, and I sat in the left seat and looked around and everything and, and got up and came out. They said, did you notice anything? I said, no. Well, look up. The bottom that was they built out of cardboard, the shape of the URC inside that headroom, and it was that much higher than me. It was that much room inside the 130 to do that. I said, well, that's a cinch. That's what we'll do. So I came back and uh, and called the Pentagon and says, okay, we're good for it. We'll do the first one for 350000 I said, do it. That's a go ahead. And uh, sometimes when we had a contract like that, if you're in a chalkboard and you got the two parties there, we'd write what we just agreed to and sign it and take a picture. And that was a contract. And it worked because people trusted each other back then. Anyway, so we did one airplane and uh, took it over to Edwards and did in-flight refueling and that. Finally, the crew called me and says, we did 35 hookups. Can we come home? And I called Lockheed. I said, get the airplane ready for delivery. We're accepting. And that airplane uh, did its job. And we did a whole bunch more of those. And how that happened was really crazy. You know, sometimes you do really stupid stuff. By then, I was a major. I really could do stupid stuff. I'm over at, at Brian Mine meeting with the squadron that had the, the uh, combat town over there. We'd have them there, and we had them at Kadena, and this kind of stuff. But uh, I went over there, and there's a red carpet from the, the car door to the, the building I'm going into. And I said, who's coming? He says, you. <laughs> Pretty good. The guy was a colonel, old colonel. He said, come on in. So I did, and he has he says, he's going to have an all-hands meeting. That means everybody in the squadron is in the room, and I'm on a platform. I uh, says, okay, what do we need to do? And they gave me a long list of things that they needed done to the airplane. And I went down and I said, oh, what is this? This is, the engine you have is not strong enough to climb the mountains that they have to climb. So we're going to have to have the Dash 15. They would fly Dash 7s. Well, TF-33, um, that, that was not it. But anyway, the engine, I understood so I said, okay, I'll give you all this stuff and I'll think about that one. And so I left and came back to the US and said, well, <clears throat> at that time, they didn't know anything about the in-flight refueling because I didn't tell them. Well, it turns out that the in-flight refueling needed the new engines. Again, I become a hero. Well, buying those C-56, they're made by Allison. That's important. And so I went to the depot down in San Antonio where they handled the engines. 
And I said, this is what I'm going to, I have a whole fleet of 130s. We're going to convert in fire refueling. I need this, these, this many T-56 engines. And they said, you know how you buy those engines? I said, don't have a clue. But I understand from my logistician there from Lockheed, he says, you come in three pieces. I said, so I need three pieces <laughs> for all those engines. So they work. And they start pumping them out. It was really... Really, really crazy. Anyway, these guys were flying ahead. I forget how many hookups I told you. And I said, yeah, that's good. We'll do one. So Lockheed got the job. Now, during this process that I was doing this, the Air Force had a wonderful idea. They said, okay, all, I had made lieutenant colonel. So they said, okay, all new lieutenant colonels that have experience with industry, we want to know who you are, and we have a special job for each of you. And the guy I was sitting with in the office said, did you get that message? I said, no, and he handed it to me. Very interesting. He said, now, here's how it's going to work. He was a lieutenant colonel. He said, you have an hour to think about it because if you don't call, I'm calling your name. <clears throat> so I said, geez. So I called back and I said, I'm very interested. So uh, they said, call this guy in Chicago. He was an Army colonel, and he was with DCAS, Defense Contract Administrative Services. That's part of DLA, Defense Logistics Agency, and he's the region commander. So he interviewed me for about a half an hour. And then his concluding comment to me was, look, you go over to Allison, I told you that would matter, in Indianapolis and look over the operation there, which is really Detroit Diesel Allison then. And if you accept that and do what I think you can do, you'll walk out of there as a colonel. And I said, God, how can I turn that down? So I did, but I didn't tell my boss. So I had to go to the Pentagon and I walked in the Pentagon and all the guys there says, when are you gonna go? <laughs> I never said it to anybody. I said, you better keep your mouth shut. I don't want him finding that before I tell him. So I went back and finally told my boss and I said, hey, uh, here's the situation. He said, well, I can make you a commander release and you'll get colonel. I said, no, nah, I think it's time. And uh, he said, well, I can't replace you. And his name was Pat O'Malley and he and I wrote the first book. And I said, Oh, did, what did you just say? He said, I can't replace you. And I said, Pat, you know me. And I walked out of the office. He didn't say I couldn't replace myself. He said he couldn't replace me. So I got a replacement. <clears throat> and I took him back in the office and introduced him to him and walked out. Oh, that was terrible. But I love that guy. He was really wonderful to work with. And, and he made my life in Big Safari what it really was wonderful. Okay, there's there's a shot of the in-flight refueling. Okay, now here's some of the funny ones. These were all done over in Ontario, California. Coronet Solo. Uh, how many of you remember Mission Impossible? You know, and I remember they showed you that picture where this airplane flew it and had a cabin in there and a, a guy sat there and they configured him to look like the president of the country. That's Coronet Solo, that airplane. Well, we were replacing that airplane. And my boss and I went to the Pentagon one time because I had the job of getting the money to do this. We we're going to convert it to a 135. And he had the job of getting the airplane. So we met at the executive dining room in, in the Pentagon. <laughs> he came in kind of sad. He says, I had a tail number until five minutes ago. I said, I got the money. <laughs> so we said, well, let's relook what we're going to use for an airplane. And we selected a, a one third. And that's what that crazy thing, look at the crazy antenna. And you see what it is, psychological warfare in Iraq. I understand that this airplane flew around Baghdad a lot with all the power it had broadcasting rock music <laughs> down on the ground. You couldn't turn your radios or TVs off. 
they would blast this stuff constantly. And <laughs> I wouldn't want to have been on the ground. That's another version. Look at the antennas on that. Like I said, if anybody says that I saw that weird 130, I said, describe it a little bit. And then I told them the name of it because we probably had our fingerprints on it someplace. And there's another ribbon chart, compass call. You'll hear compass call. Now compass call is now in the rework and it's going to be an executive jet doing the same mission. That's a new concept. And the reason is we need battlefield commanders to have their own force to work rather than have to call somebody to bring it in. And then they get the data right there and it's real time. Deny, confuse, really keep the command and control out of operation. That's its mission. So it can broadcast all kinds of stuff. The other airplane had coverage on all formats and all frequencies of all kinds of broadcast, radio, TV, throughout the world. And this thing had it too. Okay, now this happened before I was in the program and we transfer about the time I moved uh, from command and staff up back up to Dayton, uh, we had just transferred this program to the normal system. We had it operated by a few, number, few people, mostly the, down in uh, San Diego with Ryan. And these were the Navy Ryan drones. And what they were configured for, they had cameras and they had electronic collection equipment. And they were flying them. They would launch them off a C-130 into uh, Hanoi in that area. And as soon as they looked like it was you know, bingo fuel, bingo fuel, you got enough fuel to get home. Then uh, the airplane itself would automatically come out over the ocean and the Navy would send up a helicopter and hook them and take them to a carrier and then recycle. We had an operation at uh, a little island out near Magoo. Know what that island is? That's still run by the Navy. And that's where uh, they did all the, the work on these, except the work that was done at Ryan. Okay? There was one other mission I wasn't involved in, but I was asked by Lockheed to write the book on it. And it's called Scape Mean. I never yet have found out why they call that crazy program Scathe Me. Now, remember when uh, Northrop was building uh, target drones here, in Thousand Oaks? That's about the time period we're talking. This was before Iraq started. So the program was to buy a dozen or so of these Navy target drones, take them to Ontario, configure them to act like F-15s. Ground launched into Baghdad all at once, one time shot. They took off out of Saudi Arabia into Baghdad. And when they ran out of fuel, they just crashed. No explosions. There was nothing in there but the sensors. Next morning, 15 F-15 shot down over Baghdad. That was in the paper. Over there, we have a copy. That brought up all the SAMs and all the airplanes, and we had a ducky shoot, real easy. So we owned the air from that day forward in Iraq. So, all right, now let's talk about a couple other weirdos. This was a, a project for for Benny Pellet, who was a, the chief of staff of the Israeli Air Force. He wanted an airplane that could fly at some ungodly altitude, and he wanted a new camera. So he said, okay, there's two ways to do this. We can give you a HIAC that I showed you before, and that was in the RB-57F, and we can put a, uh, a pod right here on the top left picture, and that would contain the HIAC 66 inch camera. Another way is to take and extend the nose, you can see this a little bit here, of a F4, actually an F4E, and put the HIAC in that. And then right here on either side were windows where you could turn the lens 
left or right and get pictures that way. And then uh, he wanted some stuff done with the engines for the altitude. So he did research on how to make the engine think it's at a lower altitude than it should be, or that it was. And these were sprays. And uh, that did not succeed. We were working with GE, they had the engine in there. And uh, GE engineers, <laughs> I've had Betty Pellet here and a couple of his staff were down in Fort Worth. And GE uh, engineer got up and says, well, General, we have a problem. We know it'll work. We just don't know when it'll quit. So we decided we we're gonna can the thing on the engine and go for the camera, which we did. Uh, so that's that was quite an airplane. To get those airplanes, they were brand spanking new. There's four, mil, four military sales. Now that program works that we have the money and they have the need and we put the money to their need. That's an example. Okay, so <clears throat> we just had to do that. It was really wonderful. Now that's in the boneyard. If you go on the internet and say, Peace Jack, you'll see it, except it'll show you where it is on the boneyard, but you'll see that airplane that configured. Okay. We tested that thing, uh, brought in a couple of guys from Edwards, which we do when we have special testing. And we gave them the airplane and said, go down over the Gulf there in Texas and, and shoot some stuff and then tell us what you have. And it's all downloaded. So you don't have a film or anything in there. It's all broadcast down. We were watching it. And they said, well, we've done about five passes. Can we come home? <laughs> I said, yeah, it's beautiful. We're, we came out and accepted there were three of them. When uh, we first heard about how we're gonna do this, uh, I got a call from the Pentagon and says, you're getting three brand new off assembly line at McDonnell Douglas, St. Louis, RF4Es. Where do you want them? I said, we want them in Fort Worth. Well, somehow Sandy McDonnell, who was the, who was the CEO of McDonnell, called the Pentagon and tried to get me fired how dare he take his airplanes and send them down to Fort Worth? Well, the chief of staff of the Air Force comment back to him and says, I don't think you know. You better go look at the receipt. Those are my airplanes. I bought them. Not, not me, but the Air Force. And so we never heard another word. That's a world that's fun. Yes, towards the end, uh, they made a decision that the SR-71 and the, the U-2 TR-1 now will be in the big safari. And that shook up the world. I thought we were gonna have a super earthquake, but uh, that didn't happen. And so we set up two new detachments to handle those two airframes. And that went on until I, I'm probably, they're still doing the TR-1. The, the, the SR-71 went out of business in 95. It was kind of funny because I got a call. I was here and I wasn't connected, but I got a call and said, how about taking a drive up to Palmdale and, and talk to the guys and they're about to deliver the last airplane. It's going up to, to uh, Washington, to Dallas airport, and it's going to be on display up there. And the problem they were having is there wasn't anybody in the Pentagon who wanted to be near that because it was a big political deal about killing the SR-71 because we had another one in mind, okay? So there was only one general there. So I went up to Palmdale and there was, I'm supposed to look over the airplane and then tell them what I saw. I'm, I'm looking around the airplane and the damn spindles turn. And I said, what's going on? He said, we just got back. We did, we did the run, we didn't have any time to wait. <laughs> and I looked at that, and there were chunks out of those turbines like that. Mm. And I said, you got to be kidding. Me. And you flew that thing? Oh, it flies like that all the time. Really? <laughs> Not in a normal jet, it wouldn't. Anyway, they took that airplane and flew it, set a new world record going to, uh, to Dallas. And it's still there. So 
Now, this symbol, we use it a lot, but I don't think anybody remembers the fact that I created it. In 1974, when I came back and was signed to Dayton, I went into my boss and said, you know, our program really needs something. Because he and I had had a discussion because Lockheed had uh, developed a, uh, a little figure that they would put on all their boxes because we have special places all over the world, FX accounts. So all these special airplanes had the support where they were, but they didn't get mixed up with the regular stuff. So they had a turtle and he didn't like that. He got very upset. What's that damn turtle doing on his boxes? And I said, okay, Pat, here's the deal. You go off into Timbuktu in the FX account and you don't find the box. And you go across the ramp and there's all these boxes in there. They have these turtles on them. What do you do? Scratch off the turtle or say, what are my boxes doing there when they should be over here? He backed off. I said, now we're going to go for a real symbol. So I talked to heraldry in the Pentagon and said, okay, how do we do this? Says, we'll just make up the design and send it up and we'll tell you where it's going to work or not. So I went upstairs, didn't have PowerPoint. Couldn't do that. And the computers, forget it. We didn't have anything like that. So I went up to the uh, artist in the building in AFLC headquarters. And I said, here's what I want to do. And I just picked out the basic shape of a shield. And I said, the big safari goes here. And I want this shield in there because it's big safari. And I want it to look like something out of Africa. So we had the two cross things. And uh, when he got done, I said, OK, I want something different. And he says, what's that? I want blood coming off those tips, dripping off the tips. <laughs> <laughs> My boss said, that'll never work. <laughs> so I packaged it up, sent it up to the Pentagon, heraldry, and they called me and said, take the blood off and we'll go for it. <laughs> and this is one of the original transparencies I had. How about that? You won't find that in those books because I just found that. I forgot I had it. That's backwards, obviously. But So there... We can say we wrote these two books. The first one on, on uh, the Big Safari Program story with Pat and I was primarily how it works, how the whole system works. There weren't many programs we could really discuss because they were all classified. The next book was written while I was here, and I was called to be part of the team with, geez, uh, uh, I don't think we had 30 guys, you'll see it in there. And uh, we had a ball, and that was put together by L3 down in Texas. We had a, we took a part of their plant to put all this stuff together and gather it up and then make that book. And that's all the programs as of the end of that date. And this one, it was much, much earlier, but it, it was not program the purpose. I was putting together how it all works, how the system works. And I think there's a third book that should be coming. It's called Using Paul Harvey's The Rest of the Story. Okay. I think that would be good. Anyway, that's it. Any questions? Fascinating talk. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Uh, Any have, questions on the on the outsiders? We have uh, time for a few questions. Anybody from the audience here? Any question? I have a question. Yeah. Neil, these online aerial systems are being used currently in Ukraine as a security package in our platform. Yeah, and so did a lot of those airplanes that were left there in Afghanistan. I a lot. And that was a very sore spot. But anyway, oh yeah. Yeah, they're using a lot of equipment. On that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other? Wonderful. Thank you. We have, uh, let's see. Any questions? Oh, I have two questions. Just a moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
How did we get those questions? There were two. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, I thought there were two up here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Those aren't any questions. Oh, okay. That's, that's an earlier question. Do I answer the question? Oh, yeah. Was there a question? There's no question. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, <coughs> interesting. I mean, we have on the other side. Comment. Well, when you look at the <coughs> camera, huge. Yeah. This is a work. Um, it reminded an article I was reading today in the Spectrum magazine, which yeah. is the IEEE monthly. <clears throat> there is now this uh, new material called metal materials that are it's developed in the last year or so, and everybody is working on it. The purpose of that is it shrinks the size of the optic tremendously. Uh -huh. And as you were talking about those 66 yeah. inch <clears throat> focal length cameras and the size of the mirror, the primary mirror, which is really det determines the uh, power, mm -hmm. collect collecting power, and, as well as the resolution. Um, and that's why those things are so big. I saw one of those at ITEM, mm -hmm. which was uh, yeah. a division of uh, Lytton. Back, back then, huge. I was thinking if uh, these new materials were available then, those whole system would be probably this big. Well, that's, that's what cool. that's what's happening now. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the, amazing. And these airplanes that I showed you, the big ones, except for a river joint, a few of those, <laughs> that, that there's very special. You can't reduce the size of that. But uh, most of these other things are now being converted to executive jets. And there's lots of room in those for the smaller electronics, which is great. Okay, cuts the price down, everything else. Okay. Anyway, let's thank Jenny again. I believe the video, if Jerry uh, allows, would be available yeah. and would be put on the link to it, would be put online. Okay. For those of you who want to see it. Yeah, video. like you did the last time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I can't wait to get uh, the answer. So please help yourself. <laughs> yeah. Okay.